Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am super excited today to talk with uh, Matt Levy. He is a composer, performer, audio engineer, arts administrator, professor, tenor, and co-artistic director of the PRISM Quartet. Um, just such a huge wealth of knowledge, and I am so excited to talk to you today. So, Matt, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, can you give us a little bit of background, just um, your your early life and early career, and, and kind of what brought you here to this? Sure. Room? Yeah, I mean, we have, to, we have to go way back to my childhood. So, I am a native of Philadelphia, and I grew up um, like in the seventies. And um, I was in high school, like in the late seventies, early eighties. And um, like the music of that period was like funk and R and B. And I was exposed to a lot of that kind of music. My sister um, dated and then eventually married a, a great uh, funk drummer mm. from a band called Breakwater, which is, which is a major re recording. They were major recording artists with Arista records back then. Mm. And they're actually still together and they're kind of like iconic an iconic group in Chile. And um, I was, I just loved that music. You know, it was kind of the soundtrack of my childhood. Um, and, and I played in bands, you know, in, in uh, like R&B bands as a kid. And then um, actually the first band I played in, I think I was like 11 and it was called um, Atomic Tower. And we, oh, played, nice. we played like in nursing homes. And um, the one memory I have of that is that, um, there was an article covering one of the performances and someone noted that um, uh, someone, one of the patients who hadn't moved in years sat upright in bed upon hearing us. And it wasn't because we were good, you know? <laughs> so, but, but that was sort of the music that I, that I really loved, you know, as a kid. <clears throat> and then I got to high school, Central High in, in Philadelphia also, and had an incredible music theory and composition teacher. And he had actually a piano teacher too. And he introduced me to classical music. Uh, we were in class one day, he played the, the Eroica Symphony. And I just was moved, moved by it and, and fell in love with classical music. And that led me to um, audition at the University of Michigan, uh, where, I, where I ended up going and studying with Donald Sinta for my undergrad and graduate years, which were about from like 1983 to 1988. So yeah, so that's sort of, but I think my, I've always sort of um, had interest in lots of kinds of music, even though I you know, fell in love with classical music, I still um, and feel rooted in lots of other kinds of music that was part of my upbringing, you know, mm -hmm. and which still kind of dictates a lot of the work that I do in my own solo work and with Prism as well, you know. Yeah, and so, I mean, that's, is, is your, your love for, I mean, all kinds of music, is, is that part of, what led you to some of your some of your projects with Prism? Like you know, you've been doing a lot of uh, music with um, Dave Liebman. Um, uh, well, I mean the the list is long, but you've been doing a lot of kind of crossover music between combining classical and, and jazz playing. Is yeah. that part of the, your interest in that? Yeah, I think that's a really a direct kind of culmination of those interests. I, I always. Um, you know, wanted to connect the histories of the instrument in both classical music and jazz. So these two different worlds that they, you know, they interact occasionally, but I was more interested in like a formal um, um, kind of project that was, that would bring us together around a specific kind of um, framework, you know, so how could we do that? You know, and the idea is to, to um, engage some of the leading jazz saxophonists who are also great composers to write works uh, for PRISM and have them join us as soloists in their own works. <clears throat> and so that project began in 2014. And it's a kind of project that can have innumer innumerable iterations. So we, you know, we started with six composers um, and then we, we've been expanding it ever since. So we've added Phil Lovano, Phil Lovano Chris Potter, Bobby Coltrane, who will be featured on an upcoming album. And then we're working with some other other people to add right now as well. So it's sort of an ongoing, you know, years long project um, that bridges the, the different, uh, you know, performance practices of the instrument. Mm -hmm. So speaking of prism, can you 
uh, you know, obviously we're all very familiar with with that ensemble. Um, could could you give us the the background, like how it began, yeah. um, the personnel, and I mean the personnel have changed over the years. Obviously, if you can give us some some background with that, love to hear. Yeah, it. sure. Um, we started in 1984. Um, our original soprano player was uh, Reginald Gorich, and he had graduated from the University of Michigan and had finished a year uh, studying with Jean Marie Lundex in Bordeaux, and had just come back to Ann Arbor. And he and our original alto player, Mike Whitcomb, decided to form a quartet and invited me. Uh, at that point, I was in my second year at Michigan as an undergrad and Tim Miller, our original Barry player, to join them. So that was the first kind of personnel. Um, if you fast forward to, I guess, the year 1990-ish, uh, Reggie decided to um, start a family, got married, and was interested in other career options, and especially like computers, computer programming, and the stability that that also brought to his personal life. And so he ended up uh, leaving the quartet. Um, and we then brought in um, Tim Reese. Mm -hmm. Tim Reese is mostly known as a jazz player, but he studied with Larry Teal. Um, he was a native of Michigan and he studied with Larry Teal and got his master's at the University of Michigan as well. <clears throat> so he's a really formidable classical player um, and he joined the group. Uh, and he, he helped to sort of, helped us to begin that kind of process of really bridging different ways of playing and creating music. Um, and he was with us until the year 2000. And he uh, was invited to play with the Rolling Stones band. And their pay scale was beyond what we could <laughs> offer. So, you know, we decided he had to leave and we certainly didn't begrudge him that. Right. He's actually one of my dearest friends. We were just very close and uh, I love him very much. And he's, uh, you know, um, has a great career doing lots of really interesting things. Um, but his main, he's mostly known now, you know, as his course work with the Rolling Stones. Mm -hmm. uh, and when he left, we invited um, um, Tim McAllister to join us. Tim had been subbing with us already. So that was a very natural kind of uh, transition. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Tim has been with us ever since, Tim McAllister. Um, on Barry, our, our original Barry player, Tim Miller, he left the quartet in about 1994. Um, he, uh, similarly to Reggie, you know, wanted more stability than um, like a performing artist life would entail. So he, he, he had settled down into a job teaching instrumental music and directing bands. And he's now the um, principal instructor and band director for Belleville, Michigan uh, Music District. And we've been reconnecting with him lately because we have actually gone there to do residency work in his schools. So it's been a really nice way to catch up. Um, and when he left, we had auditions and, and we had never heard of Tamar Sullivan, but he was a student at Michigan State. And Joe, Joe Luloff said, you guys gotta check out Tamar Sullivan, you know? Yeah. So Tamar came in and just blew us away. I mean, he. He auditioned and it was just really something. And so he's been with us for 26 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's, and on alto, um, Mike Whitcomb, our original player, left the group in 2007 um, uh, just to pursue some more personal things. He was interested in living abroad. Um, and and um, so playing in a quartet like ours was no longer workable. So we had auditions again and, and brought in Zach Scheman, who mm -hmm. was at that time a master's student at the University of Michigan. So I think a lot of, um, you know, I think um, we all ha have similar approaches and ideas about playing that are kind of rooted in that school of playing, you know. Right. So it made sense for us to kind of go back to that well and think about, uh, you know, um, when we when we try and when we have had member changes to kind of have a continuity in terms of our sound concepts and our concepts of interpretation and that sort of thing. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And and so uh, so Zach was the most recent member, and that's thirteen that's thirteen years ago at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been a, a long run so far with the same four yeah. people. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Zach's actually, his first gig with us was um, 
we were collaborating with a dance company, um, doing a whole like a uh, program of Jakob TV's music. Actually, it's Jacob TV. I've been calling him Jakob TV, but when we flat saw him, he said, no, Jacob. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Jacob TV's music, um, we, that was all choreographed from our Pitch Black album. Mm -hmm. So that came in to this whole production and we made an album. So this is sort of trial by fire for Zach. Right. It was, it was great fun, you know. So, and he's, he's really um, been invaluable and valuable member for the group. Sure. Yeah. Um, so that... One of the one of the most amazing things to me about everything that you've done with Prism has, has just been how collaborative you've been, and and both with composers and with um, composer performers, and just with other other performers. It's really been um, amazing to see, you know, whether it's with you know so percussion or or at this point now, um, uh, you know, music. You have several um, works from. Uh, composers from China. And so, you know, music of other cultures, it's, it's just been really um, amazing to see. But like going back to the, to the beginning of it, um, probably the most famous work that, um, that, or I shouldn't say most famous work, but maybe one of the works that's most uh, recognized with PRISM yeah. is the, or the fantasy etudes, right? The Albright mm -hmm. fantasy etudes. Yeah. Can you tell me, can you tell us about um, like the genesis of that, how, how it began, how, how, what it was like working with Albright? Yeah, I mean, um, well, he was a very good friend of mine. I was his student. Um, I took classes with him. I studied privately with him for, in composition mm -hmm. and we just became friends. And, you know, um, that, that um, kind of went on beyond my years as a student. Um, and so there was, you know, he, he is one of he was one of those composers who was really immersed in the culture and performance practice of the instrument because he was at a school with a great saxophone program. So he was there was a lot of interaction between him and Donald Sinta and Sinta students. Mm -hmm. So he had been composing, you know, his sonata, uh, heater, um, duda, and other pieces. So, so he was immersed in all of the idiosyncratic kind of elements of of the instrument and. Um, and that made him a great composer um, for our medium. Mm -hmm. um, he was also a composer who embraced like lots of different kinds of music. And I think that made him a great composer in, in the sense that he could draw on lots of topics. He wasn't pigeonholed, mm -hmm. he moved seamlessly between, you know, lots of styles and genres. And it was all organic and natural for him. <clears throat> um, but also as a great teacher because he could work with students who were had lots of different kinds of interests you know yeah. so if you're writing post-minimalist music or kind of gnarly um you know serial music or whatever i mean he he um could sort of immerse himself in whatever the student's kind of mindset and sound world was and that was one of the things i really loved about him you know just that he, he took teaching so seriously and he was so invested in understanding your process and trying to help you to you know find your voice um so and i know i really value those those lessons um and so eventually you know we uh we certainly wanted to work with him and commission him and that was our one of our first major major commissions um so we simply asked him you know would you be interested in consider writing a piece for us we had the idea of applying to chamber music america for their commissioning grant so we went through the whole process. You know, he was excited. He wanted to do something, and he, um, you know, had this idea for these fantasy etudes, and the idea sounded really appealing to us. Um, he actually envisioned the piece as um, two sets or two books of etudes. So the first book mm -hmm. he completed, he never did do the second book. You know, he passed away, and that's something that was on the docket that never happened. Um, so we can only imagine how amazing those would have been. Right. Um, so the process was simply, you know, we invited him to, to write the piece. Um, we applied for funding. We got funding and he, he wrote it. And he shared snippets of the, of the piece with us as he was composing it. So he sort of wanted feedback. He wanted to hear what things sounded like. At that point, we were all living, or actually, is that true? I'm not sure we were all living in Maynard at that point. 
um, but we were able, we were there off and on, and so we could we could um, interact with him. And the first part of the piece was that he had completed was the um, Harmonium Etude, mm -hmm. and so we didn't know what to make of it. You know, we sort of it was not what we expected. So we're sort of like, wow, this piece is. I wonder what, how the rest of this is going to go. You know, because uh, because that movement has a uh, it evokes a broken harmonium, like an instrument that he would find in his uncle's closet that wasn't working properly as he was a kid in, in Michigan growing up. And he'd play the thing and the notes were broken, they wouldn't work. He'd get hissing and percussive sounds instead of pitches. <laughs> so he was trying to evoke this kind of, um, this instrument from his youth that was malfunctioning. And so we, we didn't understand that. <laughs> we were like, okay, uh, wow, I wonder how this is gonna go. So very specific <laughs> reference. Yeah, very specific. And then we started to understand, oh, wow, okay, this is, then we began to see the beauty of that piece. And then that, that etude in particular is one of the most strikingly beautiful etudes in the book. Yeah. Um, then he moved to um, the old nice, I'm sorry, um, the last movement. Um, like, uh, what's the name of the last They only movement? come out at night? Yeah, they only come out at night. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was his, um, you know, his homage to TV police Mm. Uh, shows and the and the big band soundtracks that would accompany them, and so he was uh, trying to evoke that image. You know, um, but in a lot of the music for those etudes, he was trying to kind of get away from the kind of stereotypical sounds that that the public would normally associate with the saxophone. Mm -hmm. So aside from um, they only come out at night, the, some of the other etudes are kind of turning the instrument on its side. That's what he would say a lot. Yeah. to try and kind of look at the instrument from different a different perspective you know um so yeah on our on our um album um that features his music we included a, a track at the very end in which he is actually he introduced the piece at uh, chautauqua institution and we played it there yeah so you can hear him actually talking about the piece and it, it's really you know wonderful to have that it is that was I, I thought that was a really beautiful addition to that album yeah 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 but that was really the genesis of it you know just sort of him exploring all the all these sound worlds you know each each a2 has its own kind of focus and yeah and aesthetic and topic and i think that was one of the things that was the hallmark of his work as a composer was the idea of drawing on um uh this incredible range of musical topics and doing it very organically and moving from, you know, music that was evocative of WC to gnarly atonal music that was very, you know, very complex. Uh, and just this sort of seamlessly moving between these, these ways of um, composing, you know. And so obviously he, he collaborated a lot with Senta and obviously with, with his students as well. Do you, um, how much how much was the playing of the group informative in this process you know like how how much back and forth was there or did they kind of arrive as like here's your piece oh i see yeah, yeah. um yeah. yeah i think because he was so kind of far along in his understanding of the instrument that there wasn't a whole lot of uh i mean there were some things um mm -hmm. but by and large he wrote it as he wanted it and you know, he didn't make a lot of changes. Right. He gave it to us in, in sections, and we played through through it for him. Um, and I remember going to his house, and he he was thinking about writing. Um, they only come out at night, and he was playing it at the piano for me, and it was kind of grooving along. I was mm -hmm. like, that could be cool. Yeah. Right. So so, but the, but he just he knew what he was doing. You know, I think with other composers, especially if they're writing their first work for saxophone or sax quartet. Mm -hmm. And they may not be aware of all the possibilities, you know, right. um, especially with extended techniques, mm -hmm. you know, um, but he was. So sure. that piece integrates um, like, you know, some microtonality, uh, altissimo, um, different ways of articulating, slap, different kinds of slap tonguing, uh -huh. uh, you know, so that it's all in there. Like a lot of what the horn can do is in there. You know? Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I mean, one of the hallmarks I think of his music for saxophone, at least, is is just like how um, how athletic, you know, in particular, you know, you, the dynamic 
yeah. expectations going for, you know, super soft to super loud within, you know, basically juxtapose next to one another or range things like that. I mean, he, he clearly, uh, you know, had access to, to a lot of amazing musicians there. Yeah. Um, and, but that's part of what makes his music, I think, at, at least his music for saxophone u- unique among the repertoires, his voice is so strong, you know, yeah. th- throughout that. Um, and yeah. it's, I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. Oh yeah, I think, and it's constantly open for reinterpretation and, you know, you play it and then you come back to it five years later and you're a different player. You have a greater understanding. You, you can see the depth of it even more. Yeah. You know, I had Tim Kalster's new recording, I think, you know, he had recorded it uh, of the Sonata. Um, you know, wonderful recording years ago and just released a new recording that shows like his own growth in understanding the piece and 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 you start to see even more so how ingenious it is. You know, one of the things just thinking about your your comment, um, you know, he was really interested in in the movement of sounds through space. And so a lot of the um you see in different parts where you have like um dynamics that are um staggered like one player's crescendoing the other players get crescendoing and they're all kind of moving in different you know across time in different ways and so that was reflective of his interest in things like the doppler effect mm. you know sound going by you right and, and getting louder and softer because it's like a siren or a you know so there's that kind of um kind of um like multi-dimensional quality to his writing yeah. that you know you kind of have to understand I mean, you can follow the instructions, but you, I think it, it's helpful to think about um, how, you know, all of these extra musical um, areas, you know, you know, starting with like, what is the music rooted in? What, what traditions, what other kinds of music, you know, what kinds of non-classical music <clears throat> and, and what kind of um, aspects of even science or, or um, acoustics, you know, um, you know, even there are like spectral elements to his music as well. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's very, I mean, it, it takes a great deal of um, insight and contemplation to really get to the core of his work, you know. I'd, I'd say, yeah, absolutely. And it, it seems to me that he and when you're, when you're talking about how much um, interest that and, and how many different styles Albright was comfortable writing in, and obviously, you know, he's, um, written rags and and yeah. um, uh, Bolcom and Albright seem to have a real lasting impact on the composition program. There, yeah. you know, like you know, I think now of uh, folks like Evan Chambers who are also you know drawing on different styles. Michael Doherty, all all these folks. It's amazing to see not just their works but also the lasting impact that their artistic voices have had there. Yeah, I, you know, University of Michigan. I mean, in the same way that schools, um, you know, their saxophone programs are identified by the, you know, the individual teachers who are working at each institution. I think in composition, where you have multiple, often multiple composers working, you see kind of how the school thinks about um, its approach to teaching composition through the way they curate their teachers. Mm -hmm. And I think at Michigan, um, there's been an interest in like representing lots of different ways of composing, you know, by having people on staff who can move between different mm-hmm. ways of writing, but also uh, that may be rooted in very different traditions. So like in Michigan, we have Bright Shang now, right. one of my very favorite composers, Michael Dougherty, Evan Chambers, you know. But if you look at other, other, you know, you see, you can see um, the, the way schools prioritize certain aesthetics or ranges of aesthetics by who's teaching. You know, you might see like other schools more of a, Kind of homogenous approach where the faculty are are working more in kind of similar aesthetic mm-hmm. and in other schools you see the sort of uh, much wider range of approaches right so i think for michigan it's, it's that's something they've always embraced and, and Bolkin and albright were emblematic of that you know right yeah, yeah I, I i i agree and, and obviously both um very strong friends of the saxophone as well yeah absolutely yeah so, you know, you, you studied composition with Albright or did you study theory or other music classes? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, for my undergrad, I was, um, well, in high school, I was um, 
this teacher I worked with, his name was Intula Taranta, and he was a brilliant theoretician. And so we were doing, like in high school, we were doing um, four part dictation and like mm. things that were more advanced than anything I ever did in college. Right. Yeah, he, he was just, he just really pushed us, you know. Mm -hmm. And so the air training and composition were great. And so when I went to Michigan, I was a saxophone major, um, but I just wanted to keep working in composition as well. So they opened, they allowed me to study with like Bill Holcomb, William Albright. Uh, I studied with uh, Frank Kelly and uh, Fred Laredal. So that was an, for me an amazing opportunity just to work with these composers. So I could pursue my own compositional interests as, as well as um, you know working on my saxophone playing. Yeah. Well Wow. So, I mean, especially given, especially given, you know, your, your own background with, with so much roots in like funk and jazz, but also classical, that had to be like a, a real beautiful program to be a composition, to study composition in given how widely varied their own interests were. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was sort of like just an incredible kind of time of my life, you know, being, being at Michigan. And this, and that's sort of, the, I think, I think one of the things I talk to my own students about is like really taking advantage of, of all this, you know, everything that your school has to offer, you know, mm -hmm. um, that align with your own specific interests, you know, because I think it's easy to get, you know, we work so hard to be, play our instruments well, but I think if you really examine, you know, every facet of your musical interest, you may, you may you know, find opportunities um, to work with people that, you know, in theory and composing and electronic music and production. And so those things are, can only help your artistry and your playing, you know, as a saxophonist. Right. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And so, I mean, given, um, you know, I have so many questions I want to ask you, <laughs> given all of your, your fields of expertise, um, one of the things I also wanted to ask is uh, how do you go about deciding what projects you work on? I mean, you know, when you're, when you're talking about composing or, or performing yeah. or um, like, what, what do you decide to take on and what do you decide to say no to? And what's your process there? What do you, what are your. Yeah. Um, I can talk about, you know, I have my own process for like solo projects. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't had a lot of time to do like um, many solo projects. Um, I'm doing more of that now, actually, um, because Prism has been really consuming, you know, for the last many years. Sure. But for, for Prism, um, I would say, um, you know, we each of the members of the co-artistic director. So we have monthly meetings and we flesh out ideas about um, projects we projects we might like to pursue specific composers or collaborators. Um, and so we sort of prioritize them and, and we're thinking in usually like two to five year periods because the major projects can take usually four or five years to, sure. and, you know, between the idea of doing the project and implementing it and then recording it. Um, uh, to shorter projects that might be a sort of like a one-off, like we want to work with this individual composer for a standalone piece mm -hmm. so that, but even that, you know, you'd have to allocate time for fundraising. Um, so there, but there was a process by which we, you know, we have like a, a document that we share and we have lists and lists and lists of people that are of interest to us that we might like to work with. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, but I think more, you know, I think the thing that we, we've been moving in the area of, more kind of curated projects. So we're thinking um, maybe not as much about like who do we want to work with, but what are larger thematic and curatorial ideas that would be of interest to us that connect us to the world around us. Uh -huh. um, and so, and once we come up with those ideas, then it's a matter of, um, you know, casting the right people to, to be participants in that. And so, uh, like the project Heritage Evolution is a good example, yeah. where we had an idea of bridging these two um, histories of the instrument and then deciding which which composers and which saxophonists would be the right people to, to move that along. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and so, you know, we have a, so we have that project. We, we're conceiving of these projects as ongoing projects, 
So because they're based in, based in a curatorial idea, it's not simply you do the project and it's over. It's that you keep creating new iterations of, of the theme. Mm -hmm. you right. Know, so that you can, it's not, they're, all, they're ongoing. And so that particular project, you know, could go on for years, honestly. Um, are there any, are there any projects that you have lined up, either either quartet or solo, you know, along these lines that, you know, you know, when you're talking about a two or five year document, what do, what do you what are you thinking about now? What interests you? Oh, uh, you mean for upcoming projects? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, we put off a project because of the pandemic it was supposed to premiere in March 2020, um, but that was a multi year project um, called Mending Wall, mm -hmm. and. Um, Interestingly, it started as a conversation with Martin Bresnik. Um, we wanted to commission him again. He had written Everything Must Go, yeah. one of our favorite commissions. And uh, we wanted to revisit uh, working with him again. And he said he had this idea of um, taking inspiration from the Robert Frost theme, Mending Wall, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of an examination of the kind of, the wall as a kind of a paradigm like that can represent separation and um, isolation, but also can the wall can be a canvas on which to paint and create art. So kind of looking at the, the wall as this sort of metaphorical object. And so we thought that would be a wonderful, so his idea was actually a premise for the, for the theme of the project. Mm -hmm. So we, we actually invited three other composers to create works that respond to that same theme. And then um, we invited some, uh, Tony Arnold to sing on one of the pieces by George Lewis and Arturo O'Farrell, the, the pianist, to join us in his own piece. <clears throat> so we, we, you know, we, we, for that project, we actually brought in some artistic advisors as well, where we, we had five individuals that we, we wanted to go outside of our kind of sphere and, and consider people that we hadn't worked with who, whose work might be unknown to us. And so we had a number of folks who, um, made recommendations. We had this massive spreadsheet um, of people to consider to go and to look at their work. And that project also involved a stage director, a lighting designer, um, a costume designer. <clears throat> so we had to immerse ourselves in, in those worlds as well and, and find and put this whole thing together you know, with the right cast. And so that was a really lengthy process. Um, and so we actually were preparing to premiere it. And, um, you know, so we're going to come back to it when it's safe. Um, but that was a project that from its initial kind of, the, in, the initial idea to when it would have been, let's say, premiered and then eventually released on recording would have been like a four or five year period. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know. Yeah, I know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that pressing piece. I, truly, um, Everything Must Go is is one of my favorite pieces to play. Um, if I, I don't know a single person who has ever heard or or performed that piece that doesn't love it, but the, you know the 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 third movement in particular can be so powerful. It's just you know, yeah, really really gorgeous. It's deeply moving, and that movement in particular we use we share that with. Um, when we do uh, residencies in composition departments, we share that particular movement as an example of, you know, just writing for the instrument within the standard range and not doing any extended techniques. Mm -hmm. you know, this is what's possible. And so they don't, because a lot of younger composers, you know, feel inclined to kind of delve into every extended technique and write very complex music. And we, we kind of, and that's fine, but we also want them to understand that, like, there's so much beauty in just writing for the instrument within its, within its more conservative, you know, frameworks. You know. Right, and and it's it's such a like a beautiful foil to the second movement, right? Which, yeah. which is is you know full of you know a lot of extended techniques, at least altissimo and microtones, and yeah, um, and uh, yeah, it's just. It, yeah, it's it's a beautiful work. Yeah, that that is one of my favorite pieces. I really I really love it. And he he's become become a good friend. And uh -huh. he had, uh, you know um, just um, I, he's just a just great person. You know, just really hilarious. That so we've we've had many good conversations, and we'll look forward to to um, working with him. Yeah, we're actually um, 
we're planning on a third piece with him as well, but that's something that's slated for like 2023. Um, so we're, he's one of these composers we, you know, keep coming back to because his music resonates so much. Um, yes. We just want to sort of keep this going because um, we recognize um, it's sort of like a William Albright in a way. Yeah, I, 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 I can absolutely see that. And, yeah. and also like a William Albright, I think that the, um, uh, there is the power in his music connects with not just saxophonists or, you know, um, uh, you know, musicians who are classically trained or whatever, but to right. a, to an audience of anyone. Oh yeah. yeah. His music is universally appreciated. That's why. Okay. Yeah. It, it, um, it, it resonates emotionally, like right. in a really strong way. And even the really complex writing, it's just so quirky and interesting. Like that second movement of the everything must go. Mm -hmm. To me, sounds like you know you went, you've gone into like a Atlantic City casino, and all the slot machines are ringing, and they're slightly out of tune. Yeah, yeah like this cascading <laughs> effect. So there's like a connection you can make that is like in the real world in some way. Right. Right. Me. Yeah. In this music. That's funny. I, yeah, I, I can I can see that now. Next time I play, I'll have to. I'll have to think about that one. <laughs> yeah, go to, next time you go to, you know. You know right. You can, uh... So um, one of the other uh, things that you've done that, that's, that's been really um, impressive is your arts administration. Um, so you were the, you know, you directed the music program for Pew Center, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, how long did you do that? Like, what, what um, tell us about that position and, like, how, how has that informed your, career yeah um well once prism got we started um you know we began a nonprofit organization in like 1994 maybe so we were together for quite a while uh actually 1991 and so you know and i think it's actually good to wait if you're a, a young chamber group to like really be sure that you're going to make that commitment because having a nonprofit is you know there's a certain amount of burden, administrative burden of doing that. Right. Uh, but, but we were, you know, we were committed and we started a nonprofit and began a very lengthy process of little by little this securing grants. And it's, it's, very, it's a very slow process that builds on itself. <clears throat> and then um, one of our funders was the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, which is one of the, it's actually a, a, a branch of the Pew Charitable Trusts, yep. which is one of the major um, foundations in this country. They're mostly known for like their work in um, researching, you know, polls and researching and environmental work. Um, but they they support the arts, but only in Philadelphia. So mm. they're, they're Philadelphia based. And so like many foundations, they're, they have like a geographic restriction to support their local, their hometown. You know? Yeah. Um, so we were grantees of that program and they I guess they liked the grants that I wrote to them and they invited me to interview to run their music program. Wow. <laughs> so, um, so I did, I did that. I was invited to, you know, hired to direct their music program. Uh, and I did that for 11 years actually. And that was a full-time job. Wow. And then in the evenings I would practice and, you know, uh, and write music. And so it, it was really a, it was it was really difficult to kind of balance those two worlds, mm -hmm. um, but I really loved doing that work um, because it um, introduced me to so many great artists and different kinds of music. Um, uh, part of my job was just working with our applicant organizations to help them put their best foot or feet forward, and so we we kind of um, you know I provide feedback on the grant proposals and. Um, you know, just give them advice on how they could make their best case. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and in that process, I just got to know so much, so many different kinds of music from like Carnatic music through organizations like Shruti to like, um, you know, um, um, early music uh, from a group called the um, Pifaro, the Renaissance Band. Yeah, I, and that's on your latest project, right? Yeah, that, so these relationships grew and grew and I, and, you know, I never... I could never actually work with any of these artists because it would have been a conflict of interest. You know, so I I never worked in Philadelphia. I just had a you know a red line that I would never cross. Uh -huh. I was simply just um, all of my work as a musician was outside of Philadelphia. 
you know, when I was in the position. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, but after 11 years, I just, I could no longer balance my both worlds. And I decided to just take the leap. And, um, and at that point, um, I, I left that position and decided to see what would happen if I could like become a full-time executive director for prison rather than like a volunteer director who was doing it very, very part-time. Yeah. And so that, that was the beginning of when prison sort of began a much more activity and kind of blossomed in a way. When and, I and what's the, what, what, where are we at timeline wise? On the, that was 2011. Okay. Yeah, I left the Pew Center, um, but yeah, um, that was a job that was hard to leave because it was just really great, a great opportunity. But I think, you know, you know, we all have only X amount of years on the planet. Sure. And we have to decide, you know, how we want to spend them. And for me, I wanted to sort of really see what was possible with, um, you know, if prison could, could. Um, that's, yeah. that's, that's an amazing, that's an amazing move to, to leave, the, you know, when you mentioned your, your, your former quartet mates that leaving, you know, the quartet for stability of, of right. I mean, you actually went the opposite direction. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It was like, I couldn't do both. I couldn't realize my artistic ideas. Mm -hmm. while I was a full-time director of this music program. <clears throat> and so I just, you know, strategized for a while. And, and I knew that if I were to be successful, I'd have to raise my own salary as a director. And, you know, so I'd really have to figure out how to raise enough funds to like, support myself and my family, you know. Sure. So that was, that was the challenge, you know. And that's still the challenge, you know. It's, it's like a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations, you know, there's a, there's a, um, impetus to raise enough resources to keep the infrastructure afloat, you know, and that's what it's really involved, you know. Sure. Yeah. That's, I mean, yeah, it's a full-time job as they say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in most recently, um, Zoss Records has grown out of your, your work with Prism, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we actually, we've been recording for lots of labels um through and maybe 2015 or so uh and we had released like nine albums on innova but had also recorded for many other labels and um just by the process of doing that work um we gained lots of skills about what's involved in in the in um releasing recordings like producing masters um you know the, the entire cycle of what's involved including like um you know, um, working with graphic designers and everything like, like that. And so I, I think at a certain point, it's like, okay, I think we have enough skills to just do this ourselves. And the label is sort of the middleman between the, the artist and the distributor. So like, like for example, Innova Records is distributed by Nexus of America, mm -hmm. which is the principal distributor of classical music in this country. Right. And so we thought, well, if we were to have our own label, we would like to work with them. They're already distributing our music through Innova. And so we we're able to, um, you know, request that they rep represent us and distribute our work. And they took us on. So I think in part because we had all, all of these other recordings that they were already distributing. Mm -hmm. And so they were willing to, to take, a, take on their own label. Um, and so I think, um, so we were able to just kind of, take on the work that the labels were doing ourselves. And so that involved like basically assembling a team of people that I would work with to, um, you know, everything from like studios and engineers and uh, to graphic design firms um, and that sort of thing. So we have, we basically have like a team that we work with on most recordings where we go through this entire process, you know, um, and from conceiving of a record to recording it, to putting it through post-production, to distributing it and marketing and promoting it. So that process, um, you know, I think we couldn't have done it before we did because we didn't have the knowledge and expertise, but, right. but eventually we were able to sort of cut out the middleman. So I think for lots of artists that go with labels, you know, the, the benefit of having that label's expertise is, is really important 
but there's a cost to it as well. It's like, you, you know, you often have to pay the label an administrative fee, which could be several, several thousand dollars. Some labels will keep, you know, um, large percentages of royalties and proceeds and that sort of thing. So we wanted to sort of cut out all those expenses and use the savings to do more recordings and to, yeah. to promote them, you know, in a way that we were not able to do it. Um, yeah. So are you, are you actually, are you the audio engineer on those, on a lot of those recordings that you're doing now? Yeah. So our, our basic way of operating is we invest heavily at the front end. So we hire like the great, you know, some really great engineers and rent concert halls and or studios so that we get the audio in the can at the highest possible level, you know? Yeah. And then, um, and that process, you know, unless you're, you really kind of have to do that unless, because, you know, the cost of really a great set of microphones and preamps and converters and that stuff is in, in, enormous. And so for us, the value, there's great value in, in investing in that because that's really the quality of sound that, that is so important to us. <clears throat> I then take those files home into my studio at home and do post-production. So I do the editing mix and mixing and sometimes the mastering also. Wow. Um, in cases where I don't do mastering, it's because I understand my own limitations. And so I will bring in a mastering engineer who might have a very specific expertise and for example, we did a recording of my music called um, People's Emergency Center. Mm -hmm. And so we're playing with like a rhythm section, bass, drums, guitar, electric guitar. And, um, and I needed someone who knew how to really tweak the sounds of the, like the bass drum, for example, the kick drum mm -hmm. and, and the double bass itself to like tighten up the sound and do things that I just wasn't quite sure how to do. And so I, so I work with people who kind of fill in gaps of, you know, that have knowledge that I don't have, but throughout that process, I'm always asking them, well, how, how are you doing that? You know, exactly where are you rolling off the low frequencies? Mm -hmm. So, and I think that's all of my work as an engineer has been, I've gained knowledge in that way. You know, I never studied engineering, but I've always just asking questions yeah. along the way and trying to gain knowledge. You've been an intern in all of your sessions. Exactly. Yeah. I'm just always asking questions. Right. I'm always amazed at how open so many engineers are just explaining and, and trying to, and that's really informed, um, you know, how we, um, you know, my own approach to, to um, editing and mixing, which, which I actually view as just a, a continuation of interpretation, you know, it's right. Like the, the editing and mixing is it's still musical interpretation. It's like deciding how to balance the parts, um, you know, how to pace things. Um, so it's just an extension of, of performance in a way, you know. Absolutely, yeah, I agree hundred percent. So along those lines, also like um, miking and 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 what kinds of of mics that you use. Also, I mean, it so heavily informs oh, yeah. the sound of the recording. So I mean, do you have actually like your preferred mic or, or a set of mics for the group or that you place closely or in the hall or how does that how do you think of that that's a great question i mean i've been this is the one challenge like when you use lots of studios is that they have different microphones mm -hmm. so like i have my preferred microphones um and not every studio owns them right. so I, I bought some microphones that i can bring with me to any studio that are the ones i love the most you know and you know, Tim McAllister just bought some and I, I'm noticing people buying like, you know, just you want to represent your sound in the way that you imagine you know, the idealized version of it. And so, um, and along those lines, I mean, there are three basic um, links to how sound is captured in the recording process. So the, the microphones, which are the ears of the process, they, they hear you and they represent your sound in a certain way. And then the sound passes through a preamplifier, right. which, which give, boosts the signal, but also colors the sound. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very important part of the process. We don't think about that when we're in the studio because we're thinking about what microphone we're using. Right. But the preamps are equally important. 
Yeah. So I actually bought a preamp as well that I really like. And then the last part is the um, conversion from analog to digital. So like whatever um, audio interface that you use will determine how the sound translates. As a right. So those three things are actually all equally important. Um, but for microphones, the thing that Prism has been doing is um, putting like a ribbon mic and a large diaphragm condenser mic on each player. Mm -hmm. so, and the combination of those two is um, like a composite sound. So like a Coles and Neumann or? or yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, like Coles, is, they're really beautiful. They're some of my, that's, I just got a Coles uh, 4038. Yeah. <clears throat> those are great mics. That's the um, BBC mic, right? Yeah, they're they're very dark and rich and like molasses, you know. Yeah. And, and the condenser mics are like have a brighter kind of uh, edge to them, which when you combine them actually is, creates a really beautiful, mm -hmm. you know. So it's a matter of figuring out, um, you know, how to position them. Um, and then what other kinds of mics you use in the space to capture the, the group sound or in the hall. So if you're like in, um, if you're recording in a concert hall, then you would want room mics as well. So you might have, you might have like two pairs of stereo mics. Um, one that might be like 20 feet away and others that are like 40 feet away. Right. You're getting different, uh, you're capturing different um, reflections mm -hmm. that are all integrated with the spot mics. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This, I mean, I think, I think all of us um, in this, in this time have, have really like started to uh, maybe reinvent our identities as, in terms of like, what, where are we going and, and what do we want to, uh, how do we want to shape our projects? And part of that obviously is recording when you can't be in a concert hall with, you know, full of people. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, do you, how do you get your music out there? And so like, I, yeah. I, I noticed Zach posted some picture on Facebook the other, uh, the other day, and it was a tree, I think a trio from his studio. And I saw three Coles 4038s. So I was like, I see, man. Yeah. I, yeah, so I, I, yeah. I, I knew, I knew, um, I at least figured the Coles were, were, were part yeah. of it. Yeah. Of, uh, I didn't, yeah. They have Coles there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. We recorded, we did the uh, Chen Yi concerto with them and we had our coals out. So that was nice. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. But it's all personal. There are lots of different, you really have to listen and make a personal judgment. It's like picking a horn or a ligature or reed. Um, right. And there are lots of different um, kinds of mic, every kind of microphone, there are dozens of choices. So like for, for uh, ribbon mics, RCAs are great, AEAs, and some are more costly than, that, than others. So it's really also a function of like, how much you're willing to go down that, you know? <laughs> yeah. So the the AEA R88, I recently used that, and I just like that mic blew me away. Yeah, they're great mics, and they have a really good preamp too. That is yes. specific for the TRP. Yeah, so I was gonna, I was thinking of that one, but yeah, that's a really nice preamp. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, everybody. We're, we're <laughs> <laughs> off of the weeds now with mics, but um. No, this is great. I mean, it's 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 really important. I think recording has become so much more mobile, right? It's it's yeah. so much less large studio driven, and and I mean, most engineers are they have a, a a relatively easy setup to move in and out of spaces. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, when you start to dip your toe into that, I think it really considering at least knowing a little bit about mics and what kind of, and, and pre's and what, what that imparts and what, what they contribute to the recording is really important. Right, yeah. Yeah, I would say like, um, <laughs> um, you don't have to start off with this really expensive equipment either, you know? Right. Um, so like Prism recorded the Albright etudes on, we bought four Cole, I'm sorry, Rode NT2 microphones and they're like, Two hundred and fifty dollars each. Right, and we went, but we went into a really nice hall, and you know, the hall itself can be such an important factor in oh, yeah. quality. So, like, even maybe not the greatest mics, but they're pretty good for their and a lot of bang for the buck. In a really beautiful sounding hall, will sound really good. You know? Right, you can take a great mic and put it in a if you're playing in a bathroom with a great mic, 
it's going to sound like you're playing in a bathroom. Right. <laughs> so, so there is something, you know, to the yeah. space. So I think a lot of people that are in academia that have access to great concert spaces should take advantage of that if they can. Right. Try and, you know, um, I tell my students, um, you know, um, you're, you know, we have a beautiful hall, you know, do, if you can do any recording while you're in college, it's a great idea. You know? Right. Um, so yeah, it's important. So you, you you mentioned, um, talking to your students. I mean, obviously you, you're, you're on faculty at Temple, uh, and UPenn, right? Well, I'm not teaching right now at UPenn, but I okay. am teaching at Temple. Okay. And, I, and I've doing work. I've done work for maybe five years with the Curtis Institute. Um, they have a, uh, they don't have saxophone program there, but they have, I've worked in their community artist program, mm -hmm. which is um, as a mentor. So where students would um, create projects for the benefit of the community outside of Curtis to try and connect the institution uh, to the community. You know. Sure. So, yeah. yeah. So how, how does all of this experience, you know, th that you have, how, how does that find its way into your teaching? What, like, are you are you encouraging your students to be to finding their own trajectory and and w within this wide field of music? Yeah, I mean it, it. I think it's really student specific. It's what the student, you know, the career path that they're interested in. A lot of my students are like undergrads, especially are education majors, so they really are passionate about like teaching in school systems, mm -hmm. and, but also becoming great performing artists. Um, some are interested in, um, you know. Um, performance as a principal career and teaching as well, maybe at the college level. Um, or, and one of my grad students is passionate about arts administration as well, um, about continuing her work as a, as a you know, musician and player, but also about having a larger impact by working in, in, the, in the field of arts administration. So it really is, I mean, it's about kind of nurturing the students' ambitions and interests and helping them to find a path forward, you know? And so I encourage my students to um, really examine all of their various interests and take advantage of all that Temple has to offer, you know, especially, I, I also think, um, you know, schools with strong jazz programs, I think it's really important for classical saxophone students to connect with the jazz saxophone teachers, you know? Mm -hmm. it, I mean, the instrument is, their, their classical playing will improve drastically if they can bring performance practice of playing, you know, understanding all the style and, you know, use of articulation and sound and, you know, ghosting. And if they're playing like a, the Bolcom concert suite, you know. Sure. You really need to, you, as a saxophonist, you can't, you can't really be restricted to like the Western canon, you know, because right. the instrument, the culture of the instrument spans so many ways of, playing and making music yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and i mean also the identity of, of the saxophone is you know to to most people is is a, a jazz identity right i mean that's you know exactly yeah it's kind of it would be kind of um anachronistic to think like you know that um to, to limit yourself to just one way of playing that's rooted in just strictly classical, mm -hmm. strictly classical canon when the instrument is all over the map, you know? Right. And, and composers are asking us to do things that are like associated with non-Western culture in so many ways. So I think, um, you know, and I think um, students and younger players to whatever extent they can um, like immerse themselves in other traditions also would only enhance their um, ability to be versatile and play lots of different kinds of music. Right. Well, um, I uh, I have just kind of one more question for you, and it, it kind of is a natural outgrowth of, of where we just ended. Is like, yeah. what advice do you have for, I mean, for students wanting to pursue a career in music? What what is do you have a, a piece of advice? That, I mean, and I know it'll probably be student specific, but do you have anything to offer? you know, for, for young students right now looking towards a career? Yeah. My first inclination is to say, get out. No, I'm kidding. That's, that was a <laughs> poor attempt at humor. Uh, <laughs> but no, uh, 
No, actually, it's sort of going along with, with um, what I was saying earlier, which is, I mean, it's an incredibly competitive field. And, and um, you know, there are so many great players. I mean, the, the instrument has never been in better hands. There are so many amazing players coming up. And the standard of playing has increased um, to the point where we just have this, you know, um, incredibly talented pool of young musicians coming out. Um, there isn't always the, you know, opportunities for, you know, the opportunities are not as abundant as the number of players, obviously. Sure. And so, um, so I think it's incumbent on, you know, especially younger players and students to try and just be as diversify their skill sets, you know, in areas that are, you know, in areas in which they're passionate, you know, like, so that they're not limited to strictly the, you know, career of a, performing artists but can integrate other aspects of the music field into their professions yeah. you know? um, and that can really only help them um, succeed as a player you know so I think part of it is like creating your own opportunities you know so I think um, you know if we're all waiting around for the call to play Valero you know then you won't be that active you know right. but I think how do you create your own opportunities you know what are the skills that you need to to be on the other end of that paradigm where you're creating projects and inviting people to join you and you're, you're in the position of, of um, you know, initiating projects and engaging artists. Um, and so I think that, I think to get to that point, it's really incumbent on younger artists to, to think about like, what other skills do I need to acquire, um, you know, in the field of music? So whether it be arranging or composing or, technology, but also in, in other aspects of professional life and whether it be like becoming a really great writer and able to represent yourself through writing in a way that is commensurate with the artistic quality of your product mm -hmm. um, or through even design, like become a great graphic designer, like bringing in lots of skills that will kind of help, you know, help you in lots of different ways that are um, can move you forward in a career, you know. So if you're in school now, then just I think it's a good time to affect inventory and do some strategic planning about um, what your, you know, um, where things you might want to pursue that would help you um, in, in all of those ways, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. So um, I just wanted to give an opportunity to anybody on the call. If, if you have uh, a question, um, please just feel free to unmute yourself and, or you can type it in the chat either way. Um, we'll give you a, a couple seconds for that. But in the, in the meantime, I just wanted to say, thank you so much for this. This has been just such a wealth of information and, and so much fun. Uh, yeah. I want to thank you for doing this. you you have created a, like a forum to bring the community together in a way that is really remarkable, you know, and thank you for just beyond being a great artist. I mean, you're, you're like creating this, this setting for this kind of interaction, which is really amazing. You know? I really appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Jeffrey, I, I, th I think I saw you unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I didn't want to get in the way as people were um, wrapping up, but thank you so much for this presentation, professor. Uh, such a great talk and always such a great time, uh, time seeing you. Um, off of that topic of using school as this vehicle to sort of cultivate all these different skills, um, I wonder if you had any um, advice on um, time management as students, you know, try to balance all these different skills. That's certainly something I struggle with um, as I go about my own daily life, especially yeah. during a pandemic, seemingly where we have all this time to do everything. Um, yeah, that's great. Well, it's great to see you, Jeffrey. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. And it's something that I think the answer is really in the planning, you know, to whatever extent possible, you kind of have to look at your capacity, like, how, you know, there are only 24 hours in a day. And so you have to kind of, uh, make kind of a strategic plan, you know, well, what do you want to accomplish? How much time will it take? How do you prioritize that? So you are focusing on the things that you think will be most beneficial and maybe mapping it out over a year saying, here's what, where I want to end up. Um, here's what, here's the, these are the activities that would require me to get there. And this is how long they'll take, you know? And so you could 
you could like, if there are maybe three areas that you want to pursue, you could have like a timeline for each of those that, and with, with your goals in mind at the end of the period. And then, and realize that you may not get to everything, but that's part of the process also, you know? So sometimes you'll look back and say, well, I actually did those things. Like maybe I didn't get to, you know, 50% of it, but I got to half of it and I feel really good about that, you know? So it really is, um, I think about planning. I don't, you know, I often feel like I overextend myself, you know? And so I'm recognizing more and more that you really need to examine your own capacity you know, what, what's really possible, you know, and, um, and try to be kind to yourself. So you're not, you know, that you give yourself time to breathe, you know? So, yeah. That's, that's great. And, and, and let me, can I ask a, a follow-up to that? Oh, sure. Um, I, I recently, I, and I, I wish, I wish I could remember where I read this concept. And if I, and if I do remember it later, I'll, I'll put it in the notes on, on YouTube, but um, you know, establishing long-term goals that are, you know, here's two years down the road or five years down the road, as you were saying, like, I want this project yeah. to happen. Right. Um, have you like concrete long-term goals and flexible short-term, like, so like the concept of understanding, like if, if this short-term goal, if what you've established as the short-term goal along the way to the long-term one if that can be a block if if you're you're fixated on that versus like having a flexible route to the long-term goal have you found that to be the case have you ever had projects that you had a path that you thought you were on and then you had to like take detours on the way to the end goal oh yeah yeah i mean <laughs> there's things don't always go as you intend you know you just right there are a lot of variables and you do have to be flexible and um, in navigating that, you know, yes. so, and, and like a lot of artists, you know, I have lots of projects going on at the same time. They're mm -hmm. all overlapping, you know, some are culminating, you know, in two months, others are culminating in three years or whatever. Right. But you just have to sort of coordinate those so that you're just, you're along this, you have a timeline for each one of those and you're just right. sort of working like specifically, maybe you're just entering like benchmarks in your Google calendar, like, yeah do do this at a certain point or like when you like planning like for marketing is a good example like you know you have to do certain things to market and promote project starting you know three months before the premiere or whatever right um so you just sort of every facet of project of a project requires like the, that sort of timeline you know so we build that out like in documents you know and just try and keep everything balance and moving forward but there are many times when things just you can't predict and you know the pandemic is a, probably the yeah. greatest example right you know, you know i think um this project that we had intended to premiere in march 2000 you know just putting it off cost an enormous amount of money because we had spent like great you know greatly on uh, a publicist and a lot of marketing money that could not be recouped so right. then you're dealing with like the financial impact of how you how you bring that project back to life without diminishing what you're doing, you know. So it's all kind of connected, but I think um, you know um, you have to be flexible and you have to kind of recognize that um, like there are lots of people on your side, you know. So if you're collaborating, you'll find a lot of kindness and flexibility. And, people want to work together and want to want to build something. Mm -hmm. So you just have to have open communications and, and, um, you know, recognize that part of the process is that things will not go correctly or things out of, will be out of your control. You know, right. you, have to, you have to work around that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much again. I just, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm just so grateful to you and, um, I'll, I'll, I'll put this up on, on YouTube probably later tonight. And, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yeah, it's great to see you. Thanks again for doing this. And um, you know, I look forward to catching your other, your other interviews and, and take good care. Oh, thanks. All right, take care, man. Okay, bye-bye.